Hello. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, a couple of housekeeping matters. I just wanted to let everyone know that the library has started curbside pickup, so you can take advantage of that by going on the library's website, or you can also call the referenced phone number 847-448-8630, and we can help you out with that. Uh, also, there are, as you can see, quite a number of us here this evening, thanks to our year-long reading of Baldwin with Mission Impossible and our exciting author visit. So questions will be taken at the end. So if you can please just submit your questions via chat. Those will be closely monitored by my wonderful colleague, Heather, and passed along. Uh, please keep your video and your microphone muted. And there you go. So we, I am thrilled tonight. We have Nick Bucola and his book, The Fire is Upon Us. He is a writer, lecturer, and teacher who specializes in the area of American political thought. His essays have appeared in scholarly journals, including the Review of Politics and American Political Thought, as well as the New York Times and Salon. He is the Elizabeth and Morris Glicksman Chair in Political Science at Linfield College in Oregon, where he teaches political theory and public law. Thank you for joining us this evening, Nick. Thank you, Bridget. I'm happy to be here. Um, yeah, I wanna just especially thank uh, Heather and Bridget for getting this set up. I'm, I'm always excited to hear that folks are reading James Baldwin and um, it's really my honor to uh, to be with you this evening, and and that right now um, is is such a important moment to read. Baldwin. It's always important to read Baldwin, but this is just such a um, a moment to read Baldwin, and so I'm really um, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to uh, share a little bit about the book with you. Um, as Bridget mentioned, uh, I'll talk at you for uh, just a little bit, give a kind of condensed version of of the book talk, um, so you have a sense of the story that I'm trying to tell in the book. Um, and then we'll have opportunity for, for Q&A. So please do um, you know, send your questions along and, and we'll have uh, hopefully plenty of time to have some back and forth uh, about this, this story. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen with you and um, pull up uh, some, some images for you to check out uh, as we go along. So here we go. So I wanna start out in this space. Uh, this is the Cambridge Union in England on the campus of the University of Cambridge. Uh, what you're looking at is the Union Debating Hall, which is uh, this, this old debating hall, the, the world's oldest debating society. Uh, this is a debating society that goes back to 1815. Um, and I want to take you to this space uh, 55 years ago, a little over 55 years ago, February 18th, 1965. This space was absolutely full. Every spot you can see on those benches was filled with mostly Cambridge students up in the galleries upstairs. That Those benches were completely filled. Uh, there were so many students in the space that night that you actually could not see that hardwood floor that you see right in front of you. That was being mostly filled with, with students who were sitting on the floor. The debaters, when they entered the hall, would have to step over the legs of students to get to their spots on the benches. Um, and on that night, February 18th, 1965, the students were packed in there uh, for one primary reason, and that was to see James Baldwin. Uh, James Baldwin was, uh, in those days, one of the most famous writers in the world. Uh, Baldwin was, in the words of his, uh, his friend Malcolm X, the poet of the Civil Rights Revolution. He was somebody who was, uh, in his role as a witness, poet, prophet, was, was writing down uh, so much about the experience of, of, of black liberation among many other subjects. And so Baldwin was this world famous writer. He, he was actually in England at the time to promote the paperback release of his third novel, Another Country. And I know a number, a number of you are reading Another Country right now. Um, and so the students were mostly drawn there that night by the opportunity to see Baldwin, who was second only to Martin Luther King as a kind of face of the civil rights revolution. Um, but they were also intrigued by the prospect of seeing Baldwin share the stage. Can you see me now? Oh, we got somebody unmuted here. Um, oh. uh, so, um, so Baldwin was going to share the stage with William F. Buckley Jr. Uh, and Buckley was not quite internationally famous yet. He would go on to achieve international fame. Um, and so the students at Cambridge didn't know that much about him. But based on the rumors going around campus and some of the early um, sort of reports that were, you know, in the student newspaper and that sort of thing, um, they knew that Buckley 
was a, uh, going to be a worthy foe for Baldwin. Uh, Buckley was second only to Barry Goldwater as a kind of face of the conservative movement in the United States. He was a founding father of American conservatism. He was somebody who with his voice and with his pen was really uh, helping shape what would become the American conservative movement. And so the students knew that much about him. And they also knew that Buckley was one of the great critics of the civil rights revolution that Baldwin in so many ways represented. So the students were there in part to see this kind of intellectual battle before their eyes. Um, and on that very night, one of the things I think is important to, to note is the context, right? February 18th, 1965, we're at the really the high tide of the civil rights movement. Um, we're in the midst of the Selma campaign, the cam campaign that was focused on voting rights. So for those of you who've seen um, Ava DuVernay's fabulous film, Selma, uh, one, the night, February 18th, 1965, is actually depicted in that film. Um, it was the night of the Marion protest, the pro a protest uh, that led um, ultimately to the murder of a 26-year-old of a civil rights activist named Jimmy Lee Jackson uh, at the hands of Alabama law enforcement. So that, that, was, that happened the same night Baldwin and Buckley were squaring off at Cambridge. And Baldwin and Buckley were there at Cambridge to debate the following motion. The, the motion was, the American dream is the expense of the American Negro. And that was a, a motion that was formulated in part to, to debate the civil rights movement, but also to debate larger questions about race in American life. And Baldwin and Buckley were really uh, the perfect people to have discussed this motion uh, that night. So the debate itself is the climactic moment in the book. Um, Bridget held it up uh, you know, before, and you can see that it's a pretty thick book. So it can, I like to tell people it can be used as a doorstop or as a weapon. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a hefty book. And the reason it's, it's such a large tome is the debate itself is a climactic ch chapter, in the, two chapters really in the book, but it's actually a joint intellectual biography of Baldwin and Buckley. As I started on this project, um, I had an idea of writing a smaller book about this, this really dramatic night when these two really important public intellectuals clash at Cambridge. But the more research I did, the re I realized there was really a much broader story to tell, a longer story to tell. Baldwin and Buckley were born about a year apart from each other. Um, and so what I do in the book is I kind of weave their, their lives, most of their intellectual lives, against the backdrop of the rise of the civil rights and conservative movements, these movements that they each respectively did so much to shape. Um, and so the, the, you have to sort of, the book starts with you at the Cambridge Union walking into this space that we're looking at right now. Uh, and then you have to wait 250 pages to get back to the Cambridge Union. Um, and so I, I really wanted to set up, you know, the debate in that way, give you a sense of how these two individuals thought through time. And so what I want to do tonight is just give you a little bit of a sense of that story in very short form because it is uh, a long story and there's a lot of detail. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, the chapters uh, leading up to the debate, uh, as it were, and then I'll play a couple short clips from the debate itself, which was recorded by the BBC uh, back in those days, and we still have that recording available to us on YouTube. Um, and then we'll, we'll have a chance for uh, some back and forth. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about young James Baldwin. So Baldwin is born in Harlem in August 1924. And Baldwin in his, uh, his, his essays and also in his fiction writing, especially Go Tell on the Mountain, gives us a sense of what the world looked like through his eyes as he was growing up in Harlem in the 20s and the 30s. Uh, Baldwin describes uh, one of the, the central themes in, in Baldwin's writing about his childhood is a kind of sense of domination that he experienced, a sense of uh, sort of forces coming at him from multiple directions, limiting his freedom and opportunity. Uh, Baldwin says that uh, there's a kind of sense of claustrophobia that marked his childhood. And one of the really powerful ways he brings this out is he was the oldest of, of nine children in his family. And so he says he, he sort of describes these scenes of waking up in you know, a sort of dilapidated apartment, uh, sharing a bed with several of his siblings, right? And feeling this sense of claustrophobia. And then he talks about the world outside of their apartment. He talks about the experience of his parents trying to find work uh, in those years, trying to support their family. And Baldwin says that, especially through the, the figure of his father, uh, David Baldwin, um, he tells us about the experiences of his father who Whose, whose life is really marked by this desperation to try to feed his kids, right? So Baldwin says, my father was somebody who uh, was sort of eaten alive by despair. And the older I got, Baldwin says, I, I understood why he was so, uh, so, so in so much despair, right? Because he was a man who was trying to feed his family and he found that extraordinarily hard to do. Um, and so 
Baldwin describes this experience uh, in, in his writing really, really powerfully. And one of the things that I think is important about it is he, he describes this experience of domination as, as sometimes having a human face. He says that there are, you know, there are instances in his own life and in many of the, the folks around him who are victims of police brutality. There are, uh, he says, that the landladies, the landlords, the insurance agents, the, uh, the home relief workers, all sorts of people who are constantly limiting him and the folks uh, that he knows in his neighborhood. Um, but he also describes really powerfully a kind of oppression, a kind of domination without a human face. He describes the bottomlessly cruel structures of power, right, that don't have a face but limit his freedom and opportunity and the freedom and opportunity of so many around him. So Baldwin describes that very vividly uh, in, in, in his writings, and I definitely recommend to you that you check out both his nonfiction and fiction to get a sense of that, because Baldwin is so good at helping us see the world uh, through the eyes of others. Um, and I, I wanna say before I by transition to Buckley, it's also important to note that Baldwin, it's not just, he doesn't just wanna paint a picture of, of domination and oppression. He also wants to paint a picture of resistance. Uh, so in his fiction and nonfiction, one of the things that we capture, one of the things that he does so well is to show how in that context people fought back, how in that context people found freedom and joy and love. And Baldwin thinks that's absolutely crucial uh, to understanding uh, you know, the life that he's trying to, to, to show, the, show, the life he's trying to describe, but he thinks that's also crucial to understanding how we might escape the sort of nightmare of, of the, the Harlem ghetto, as he called it. Now, Baldwin, um, a, year, a year later, a little over a year later, William F. Buckley Jr. Uh, is born in New York City, born in the same city as, as James Baldwin. Uh, and I say in the book, he may as well have been born on a different planet. Uh, Buckley um, is, is somebody, whereas Baldwin describes this experience of his childhood as being marked by claustrophobia and a sort of sense of a lack of opportunity, a lack of freedom. Buckley, when he describes his childhood, as opposed to claustrophobia, it's seemingly limitless space. Buckley spends most of his childhood on a 47-acre estate in Sharon, Connecticut, known as Great Elm. And he has at his disposal, uh, you know, this incredible array of opportunities. So his, his parents, mostly he's homeschooled. Uh, they have live-in tutors who live in the home. They have live-in servants uh, who, who live on this estate with them. Um, he, they have all these visiting uh, tutors that come in to teach the Buckleys every subject under the sun. You name it, the Buckley kids were, were um, you know, were, were learning it in this household. Um, and Buckley, one of the things that Buckley and his siblings, so he has nine siblings, uh, Buckley and his siblings were being taught not only every subject under the sun, but they were being taught a, a particular worldview. Um, and it was a worldview that they, you know, sort of two major pillars in this worldview. One was a very devout uh, kind of conservative brand of Catholicism. And the other was a political doctrine uh, they called individualism. And the term individualism for the Buckleys was sort of meant to capture, was kind of a catch-all term that was meant to signal their resistance to any form of collectivism. So obviously communism, socialism, uh, the New Deal policies of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, but the Buckley children were also taught to be suspicious of democracy. Uh, the Buckleys were taught that some people are fit to rule and others are fit to be ruled. And uh, good news, Buckley children, you are fit to rule, they were taught. And it's really important to note that the Buckley, uh, this sort of Buckley belief in hierarchy was thoroughly racialized, right? It was racialized not only in what the children were taught, but what they saw in their household, how they saw their parents treat uh, many of their servants who were people of color. So they had this estate in Connecticut. They also had an estate down in South Carolina. And so Buckley experienced a kind of racism. And one thing that's worth noting about William F. Buckley Jr. is that he and his siblings acknowledged that their parents were racist. They, you know, Buckley, uh, they, they acknowledged that they were, they were taught to believe in racial hierarchy. But Buckley, William F. Buckley Jr. tells us it was a particular kind of racism. Um, it was a genteel kind of maternalistic, paternalistic kind of racism. Um, the, the Buckley children were taught that they should not have animus toward those uh, who were not uh, of the white race. They were taught that they should feel a sense of obligation to care for those who were beneath them, especially those who were loyal. So you can kind of imagine where this is going. This is the kind of philosophy that Buckley is taught when he's growing up, and it has great relevance from his childhood to the, the night that he squares off against Baldwin. Um, now, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna go over this very quickly because I wanna really focus uh, this talk on their views of, of, of race and civil rights, since that's the, you know, I think that the sort of central theme in the book. So there's 
kind of middle, a middle chapter or two where I try to develop a little bit of the worldview, uh, how young William F. Buckley and young James Baldwin carry their worldview into the world, right? So they're in the late 40s and 1950s, both of them are kind of arriving on the intellectual scene in different ways. So I try to tell that story of what it looks like as they're arriving on the intellectual scene. What I have pictured here is uh, William F. Buckley Jr. Um, in his role as chairman of the Yale Daily News. So Buckley, uh, he goes off to prep school, he serves in the US Army for a couple years, and then he enrolls at Yale. And Buckley says what he expected to find at Yale was you know, professors at the podium who would reinforce that worldview I just described, would reinforce that, his, that sort of uh, Christ, his commitments to Christianity and to individualism. But what he often found was uh, professors who were either um, indifferent about those things or even hostile to them, right? So he says that the sort of paradox of, of, of places like Yale and other institutions of higher learning is Christian individualists send their kids off to college only to have them converted into atheistic socialists, right? So Buckley uh, begins to raise hell while he's on campus. And what he, what he really is sort of attracted to is one of his professors at Yale is actually a conservative, a guy named Wilmore Kendall. And Professor Kendall teaches Buckley an idea that ends up being central to his political philosophy. And that is the idea of a public orthodoxy. Uh, Kendall is a committed uh, anti-communist and Buckley was a committed anti-communist. And what, what Kendall teaches Buckley is that any sane society is a closed society. The idea of an open society is a very dangerous one, uh, Professor Kendall says. And what Kendall had in mind is there's certain thoughts, there's certain beliefs that cannot be expressed for a society to hold together. And so but Kendall was a very adamant defender of anti-communism. That ends up being a, a central part of Buckley's uh, political philosophy. So Buckley graduates from Yale. He writes his first book, God and Man at Yale, which is an indictment of his alma mater in which he condemns this kind of liberal philosophy of education uh, that it's not the, the problem for Buckley is not the professors are indoctrinating their students. It's that they're indoctrinating them with the wrong ideas. So what Buckley calls for is for boards of trustees and for administrators to impose more, to take more control over who is hired and who is fired and what is taught. And if that wasn't controversial enough, Buckley kind of takes on what he calls the hoax of academic freedom. His next book is a defense of Joseph McCarthy, who was leading the latest Red Scare in the country. So Buckley uh, co-authors this book, McCarthy and His Enemies, and he says, look, McCarthy is not perfect. He's an imperfect instrument, but he's doing really important work. Um, he, is, he is enforcing that public orthodoxy, which is so important for our society to hold together. So that gives you just a little sense of Buckley in the, in the kind of early years. Um, right around the same time, the late 1940s, early 1950s, Baldwin is, is establishing himself. So Baldwin leaves the United States in 1948. So Baldwin watches his father really consumed by despair. And what, one of the things Baldwin reflects on in his autobiographical writings, especially uh, the essay Notes of a Native Son, he describes that sort of watching his father, uh, you know, the, the, the destruction of his father really. His father dies in 1943. He's uh, ultimately, before he dies, he's committed to, uh, you know, a, um, a mental institution. Uh, and he, Baldwin says, I, I wanted to figure out how I could avoid becoming my father, how I could avoid uh, becoming consumed by despair. And really for Baldwin, the way out, the escape, the handle, the lever, the instrument that he uses to escape this atmosphere in which he finds himself is language. Baldwin is obsessed with books from a very young age. He begins writing at a very young age, and he's really trying to figure out how he can use language as his way out of this situation. And one of the things he realizes in the late 40s is he needs to leave the United States in order to, uh, in order to survive. And so he leaves in 1948. He wants to write about his experiences growing up, but he realizes he can't do that without the critical distance that, that, that is necessary. Um, and so he goes abroad, he ends up writing um, his first novel, Go Tell on the Mountain, which many of the folks have read. Uh, this really powerful autobiographical novel where there's a character a lot like his father, uh, character, characters that are like him uh, in various ways. And that novel is, is a really powerful indictment in some ways of the mythology of the American dream, which is the theme of the debate with Buckley. So that's something we can talk about in the Q&A if you'd like. Um, but Baldwin is also writing reviews in this period. He's writing essays. He's trying to sort out, as he said uh, famously in his autobiographical notes in, in 1955, how to become an honest man and a good writer. And Baldwin in, in this period in his fiction, his nonfiction, he's really obsessed with um, the nexus of three things, uh, identity, morality, and power. Um, the question of identity is at the core
core of Baldwin's philosophy. He is obsessed with this, this sort of question of who do we take ourselves to be? Who do we take ourselves to be as individuals? Who do we take ourselves to be as members of groups? And how is that construction of identity, how is that related to how we treat one another in the world and how we treat ourselves? And Baldwin, uh, he says that the, the sort of question of power is related to both those things as well, right? Who has power? Who doesn't? How is our construction of identity related to how, you know, who has power in the world? And is that power, is that distribution of power justified? And if not, what can we do about it? And so Baldwin is really obsessed with these questions and his diagnosis, as he thinks about those questions, but again, through both his characters in fiction and through his subjects in nonfiction, he, his diagnosis of the human predicament is that most of us, most of the time, really all of us all the time, if we're being honest, are in a state of identity crisis. Um, and Baldwin says that what our identity crisis is rooted in the idea that we, we really don't want to know who we really are, right? So what we do is we construct false identities. We construct false identities that make us feel safe. And Baldwin says, you know, if you want to understand racism, if you want to understand homophobia, you want to understand xenophobia, you want to understand any ideology of exclusion, um, really what you need to understand is that, that fundamentally human beings are scared and they're looking for ways to construct identities that make them feel safe. And so Baldwin, his second novel, Giovanni's Room, which, which many have read in 1956, is a novel, you know, it's dismissed by some of the people, some of the people who'd worked with Baldwin on his first novel. Um, one of his editors calls it an all white gay novel. It's about a, a white American, David, who goes, is, is spending time in Paris and he falls in love with an Italian bar bartender named Giovanni. And the, the novel tells their, the story of their love affair from its enchanted beginnings to its bitter end. And Baldwin, it, this novel is dismissed. And you know, one of the things that one of his editors says to him is that you are a promising young Negro writer, Jimmy. I'm not gonna publish this. This is gonna ruin your career. Um, and Baldwin's point in response to that, I think is really important to understand what he's all about, which is that, you know, he says, if you think Go Tell on the Mountain is primarily about race, and you think Giovanni's Room is primarily about sex, you're missing the point. Um, th these are both stories about fundamental human, the fundamental human predicament, this problem of status anxiety and what we can do to break out of that, what we can do to break out of these false identities and, and treat each other more humanely and treat ourselves with more dignity. Um, and so I'll come back to kind of Baldwin's, that's kind of his prescription. I'm sorry, that's his diagnosis. I'll come back to the prescription um, at the end and we can talk a little bit about how Baldwin thinks we can, we can get out of this mess. Um, Buckley, just to very briefly, Buckley plays this role, this outsized role in the, the development of American political history because he founds his own magazine in 1955. It was helpful to have that very wealthy father who provides him um, with a, a, a nice you know, seed money to get this magazine started. National Review um, ends up playing an outsized role in the shaping of, a, of an American conservative movement. There really wasn't something we could call a coherent conservative movement at the time. There were disparate groups on the right who were all kind of united under, under what they didn't like. And so Buckley gets various groups together, libertarians, traditionalists, anti-communists, and says, look, there's a lot we don't agree on, but we can all, all agree we don't like communism and we don't like liberalism. So he tries to sort of create a movement through the magazine, invite people in to be part of this movement, and he sort of serves this role, uh, as one of my colleagues puts it, uh, in a really good piece about Buckley as, as the editor of conservatism, using a magazine as a way to shape a movement. Um, and we can talk more about that if you'd like. And one of the things that's really fascinating um, about this moment in which Buckley is doing this is in 1955, the lead up to the magazine, he's building, you know, getting investors and that sort of thing in 1954 and launches the magazine in November, 1955. That coincides with the, the sort of the latest phase in the civil rights revolution, right? The civil rights revolution goes way back, right? We can't really just limit it to one period. But obviously 1954 and 1955 are extraordinarily important moments, right? 1954, we have the Brown v. Board school desegregation decision. We have the incredible white backlash against that decision, the rise of the white citizens councils, uh, the Southern Manifesto, this resistance to this decision. Um, and, uh, and Buckley, and you also have the, 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 uh, the arrest of Rosa Parks, the rise of Martin Luther King, um, the, the, the lynching of Emmett Till, all this is happening during the months when, when, uh, when Buckley is founding National Review magazine. And so one of the big questions before Buckley is the editor of this magazine that he hopes will be the foundation of a movement is where's the magazine gonna come down on questions of, of race and civil rights? 
And one of the things I, I like to just remind audiences is it's not a foregone conclusion that someone founding a conservative magazine in 1955 will take the position Buckley takes. There were a lot of conservatives, people who thought of themselves as conservatives, who thought of themselves also as friendly to civil rights. But Buckley chooses another path and it has major consequences for uh, the history of American politics down to us today. Um, and so I'll, I'll give you just a very, I, what I have pictured here is um, Buckley surrounded by various folks that are leading, um, leading in opposition to uh, the black liberation struggle. And so Buckley, just to give you the conclusion first, and then I'll just give you, a, a, you know, just a hint of the reasoning. Um, Buckley and the magazine are critical. They're in positions of a position of skepticism or downright hostility to the civil rights movement at almost every turn. Um, so they make it very clear from the first issue of National Review, they're against Brown v. Board, the school desegregation decision. They're against any federal intervention to, uh, to challenge Jim Crow segregation in the South. Um, they end up being, they are, they have some a room for, they think that economic boycotts are, are a legitimate form of protest. So they're willing to defend Martin Luther King when he's engaged in an economic boycott. That's one of the sort of few exceptions to their hostility to the civil rights movement. But everywhere else, they're critics of the sit-in movement, they're critics of the Freedom Riders, they're, they're, they're generally critics of King uh, and other civil rights activists. They're against the Civil Rights Act of 1964. They're against the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Buckley says his goal for the magazine was for the magazine to be on matters of race, extremely articulate, non-racist, but not dogmatically racially egalitarian. So he's trying to walk this really fine line, non-racist, but not necessarily racially egalitarian. And so this ends up being the case that he allies himself with people like Senator Strom Thurmond, who gets a lot of love in the magazine, who was actually a family friend, Buckley's father's favorite politician. Uh, this is the leading salesman for segregation pictured on your, the upper left there, James Jackson, Kilpatrick, and I, I can tell you more about uh, each of these folks in the Q&A if you'd like. Um, down here in the right, you see Richard Weber, who was a uh, University of Chicago, uh, a professor of rhetoric, who was a Southerner, who wrote these very um, sort of uh, sophisticated philosophical defenses of what he called the regime of the South or the Southern way of life. And even in, your upper right, in the upper right corner, people like William J. Simmons, who was the leader of the White Citizens Council movement. Buckley is cozying up with him behind the scenes. And so Buckley himself in 1957, um, his most infamous kind of a statement about race and civil rights is, is in an essay called Why the South Must Prevail. And Buckley says, and I have it featured here in my opening slide, so I'll just show you directly what he says. Um, he says, the white community in the South is entitled to take such measures as are necessary to prevail politically and culturally because for the time being, it is the advanced race. That was Buckley's position. So th running through his, his philosophy on these issues was a kind of um, philosophy of white supremacy. There's no, there's no other way to put it. He thought of it as a non-racist philosophy of white supremacy, but that's what it was. Um, and so Buckley is debating with his, his crew at National Review just how far they ought to go in resistance of civil rights. And so I get into a lot of detail of that in the book, because I really think it's important we understand how this was rationalized in that time. And a lot of the reasons that come up in that story are relevant to us today. Um, now, one of the most powerful things for me as a writer, one of the most powerful moments was after I do this really deep dive into Buckley and his crew resisting black liberation, um, I transitioned to Baldwin, who's making his first trip to the American South. Right at the same moment when Buckley is writing Why the South Must Prevail, James Baldwin is sitting in the living room of a 15-year-old kid who is the first African-American student to attend a previously all-white high school in Charlotte, North Carolina. And Baldwin is sitting there looking into this young man's eyes and Baldwin wants us to try to see the world through this young man's eyes. And he says, I'm looking into this young man's eyes. He's describing his experiences of showing up the second day of school and seeing his white classmates arm in arm forming a barricade at the front of the school to keep him out. He's describing the experience of being a victim of you know, verbal and physical assaults at the hands of other students. And Baldwin says, I just found myself wondering how he faces what must be the most difficult moment in his day, the morning when he wakes up and realizes it all has to be gone through again. So Baldwin is really thinking about, you know, you think about Buckley operating at this level of abstraction, and then Baldwin is bringing you into this living room to actually think about that. And then he, Baldwin talks to the young man's mother and tries to talk, he goes, how is it that you had the audacity, had the courage to even apply for this integration program? 
uh, only a hand, you know, only a few dozen African American parents in Charlotte, a city at the time had 50,000 African American people, only a few dozen parents even applied for the program. So Bob wants to understand from her, how did she have the courage to do that? How did she, in a sense, ha you, know, say, you know, have the, the courage to send her son, you know, marching toward that barricade? And then Baldwin goes and talks to the, the white principal of the school. And he wants to try to understand how this man understands his role. And Baldwin is, is someone, he wants to, you know, try to get us to see the world through this white principal size, this young guy. Baldwin says, to my surprise, I found him to be a gentle and even honorable human being. But I also saw that he was deluded. He was unable to really see the humanity in this young man uh, who was being, you know, who was being, uh, you know, uh, picked on in the school and trying to, and the other students were trying to keep him out. And so Baldwin wants us to try to understand what this principle, what this principle is seeing, how everything he had been taught up to that moment had led him to the conclusion that his role was to be one of the guardians of the fortress of white supremacy. So Baldwin wants us to understand that. Right? He wants us to see that this isn't necessarily a monster. In fact, it's a human being, human, all too human. And Baldwin is trying to get us to, to come to terms with that. Um, so I want to play clips from the debate. Um, I think I've uh, uh, said, said you know, more than enough. And I, I just give you a sense here. This, this slide just captures 1962, 1963, 1964. They kind of lead up to the debate at Cambridge. Baldwin and Buckley are in the eye of the storm. And they are so prolific as writers, both their published writings and also as letter writers, that really as a writer, I had a, a sort of peek into their minds every day as they were you know, living through and helping shape this history. And so uh, there's a lot that happens in that period, and I'm happy to talk about their particular reactions to these, these major moments that they are witnessing, responding to, and, and or a part of, the March on Washington and so on. Um, but so you, so they're sort of like clearly establishing themselves as two leading writers to leading public intellectuals um, and on the question of civil rights they are at odds and they're starting to you know Buckley has definitely taken notice of Baldwin leading up to 65 does not like what he reads in Baldwin he views Baldwin as a threat to western civilization um, and so in 1965 when they're invited to debate at Cambridge and I can give you the backstory in the Q&A of how they ended up there that night which is, is was one of the first puzzles I wanted to solve um, they are they are sort of the perfect match for each other in terms of this totally dr dramatically different worldviews, dramatically different life experiences. And so what I want to do is just play two short clips from the debate and then we'll, uh, we'll have some conversation. So um, bear with me for a moment here um, and we will, first is uh, James Baldwin. So again, the motion before the house um, is the American dream is the expense of the American Negro. Uh, and here's a little bit from Baldwin's speech. born in that glittering republic and in the moment you are born since you don't know any better every stick and stone and every face is white and since you have not yet seen a mirror you suppose that you are too it comes as a great shock around the age of five or six or seven to discover the flag to which you have pledged allegiance along with everybody else has not pledged allegiance to you it comes as a great shock to discover that Gary Cooper killing off the Indians when you were rooting for Gary Cooper, that the Indians were you. It comes as a great shock to discover that the country, which is your birthplace and to which you owe your life and your identity, has not in its whole system of reality evolved any place for you. The disaffection, the demoralization, and the gap between one person and another, only on the basis of the color of their skin, begins there and accelerates, accelerates throughout a whole lifetime to the present you realize you're 30 and are having a terrible time managing to trust your countrymen. By the time you are 30, you have been through a certain kind of mill. And the most serious effect of the mill you've been through is again not the catalog of disaster. The policemen, the taxi drivers, the waiters, the landlady, the landlord, the banks, the insurance companies, the millions of details, 24 hours of every day, which spell out to you that you are a worthless human being. It is not that. 
is by that time you've begun to see it happening in your daughter or your son or your niece or your nephew. All right, so I'm gonna, uh, you, you could go, I could go on. I mean, the Baldwin speech is, is incredible. Uh, you should definitely check it out on YouTube if you have not already. Um, and I, now I just wanna give, so Baldwin delivers a speech. He gets a standing ovation at the conclusion of the speech. Uh, and Buckley uh, says that he knew it wasn't going to be his night. Um, and let me just play a little bit of, of Buckley's, uh, Buckley's speech and then we'll chat. Everywhere he goes, uh, treats him with the kind of unction, uh, the kind of satisfaction uh, at posturing carefully for his flagellations of our civilization that indeed, uh, quite properly, uh, commands the contempt which he so eloquently showers upon us. Uh, it is impossible in my judgment uh, to deal with the indictment of Mr. Baldwin unless one is prepared to deal with him as a white man. Unless one is prepared to say to him, the fact that your skin is black is utterly irrelevant to the arguments that you raise. Uh, the fact uh, that uh, you sit here as is your rhetorical device uh, and lay the entire weight of the Negro ordeal on your own shoulders uh, is irrelevant to the argument that we are here to discuss. The bravamen of Mr. Baldwin's charges Ameri of, against America are not so much that our civilization has failed him uh, and his people that our ideals are insufficient, but that we have no ideals. That our ideals rather are some sort of a superficial coating uh, which we come up with at any given moment in order to justify uh, whatever commercial and noxious experiment we are engaged in. Uh, thus, uh, Mr. Baldwin can write his book, The Fire Next Time, uh, in which he threatens America he didn't, in writing that book, speak with the British accents that he used exclusively tonight, but in which he threatened America with a necessity uh, for us to uh, jettison, uh, for us to jettison our entire civilization. The only thing that the white man has that the Negro should want, he said, is power. But All right, so. Uh so Buckley goes on from there. We can talk more about each of their speeches um, in the Q&A if you'd like. Uh, but I'm going to wrap it up. I just want to say, by way of conclusion, uh, the aftermath of the debate, the, the, there's one chapter in the book that sort of deals with later in 65. Two, two and a half weeks later, we have Bloody Sunday, uh, pictured on the left of your screen there. Baldwin and Buckley meet uh, and debate one more time on the television show of David Susskind um, in, in May of, of 1965. Buckley runs for mayor of New York City. Uh, launches his campaign in June of 65. And, um, and, uh, and Buckley, you know, well, somebody asked me in the Q&A about their, their reflections on um, the debates that they had uh, with each other. And I can tell you a little bit about, um, about how each of them thought about these debates after they happened. But I will stop there so I can take questions. Thank you for your attention. And I look forward to your, your questions and comments. And I'm sure there would be a, a, a sort of huge applause if we were in person. But uh, um, let me just, I'm gonna stop share so I can see everybody. Uh, and there we go. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, so a couple questions. One of the questions is, did Buckley ever change his position or soften? So yeah, so I mean, the, the sort of, um, the, the sort of dominant narrative about Buckley on questions of race is that it's, it's a story of redemption um, and that he, uh, that he, you know, by the end of his life comes around to accept that he was wrong in those days. Um, I went into the book with accepting that narrative as true. Um, I, I left the reason, you know, I sort of, I left the book uh, with not really believing that narrative anymore. Um, there's, there's little question that Buckley, you know, made a kind of progress over time on questions of race. But one of the things that um, is, is pretty remarkable is that unlike some of the figures, you know, sort of, I mean, to his right, as it were, on race, Strom Thurmond, James Jackson Kilpatrick, they kind of offered more, more clear, even George Wallace, uh, more clear kind of um, statements later in life where they said they really regretted some of the things they did. Buckley's statements, when you actually look at them, are a little bit 
you know, slippery. Um, and so what I think is really important though, is that, is that Buckley, you know, he really, he evolved for sure. He was adapting throughout, you know, the time I'm covering the book and certainly later in life. Um, and I think that's really important to understand is how that adapt, how that adaption happens and adaptation, how that happens, whatever, I don't know if that's, I may have just made up a word, um, that how that happens over time. Um, and, and yeah, I would say he never offers a kind of totally, you know, there's some statements that come pretty close to an apology, but never quite all the way there. And I think that's an important thing to know. And really what's more important to me, you know, as, as, I, as I, you know, say in the conclusion of the book, um, is that, you know, I, if, if he apologized in 2000, if we can read what he said in 2004 or whatever as, as an apology, fine. Um, I still think the story that that I'm telling in the book in this period where he has this extraordinarily important role in the conservative movement, that's really important we understand what he said then when he really, uh, when, when the sort of the chips were, you know, on the table, so to speak. I just want to remind people, please submit your questions in the chat box on the bottom of the right. And then here's the mouthful, but a very articulate question. So. A fiction writer has to imagine the internal life of his or her characters who may be completely different from him or her. Buckley did not write fiction. Did this difference in the kind of writers that Buckley and Baldwin were make any difference during the debate? Wow, yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I should say, uh, Buckley did write fiction after the debate. Um, so he, he wrote, and I, I will confess, I've read very little of William F. Buckley Jr.'s fiction. Um, he wrote these kind of spy novels uh, and some like kind of, uh, but anyway, but I get the, the, the setting that aside, if, if you're interested in William F. Buckley's fiction, it's out there, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. But, um, but the, the, the point that the, the, um, the questioner is, is raising is a really, really important one. Um, yes, I, I mean, I think that really does, that does matter. And I, I thought a lot about this as I was, um, you know, doing the research for this book. I mean, the nature of the writing that Baldwin and Buckley are doing, um, I think does help you know, it does influence, it does shape in various ways um, some of the conclusions that they reached. Um, Buckley, you know, I think that one of the things Baldwin concludes about Buckley is that he really did not have the ability to listen, to really hear what other people were experiencing. Um, and, and I think part of that is this sort of lack of imagination that the questioner is getting at. Um, Baldwin really did I mean, that's the thing, that was Baldwin's thing. That's why I thought, you know, it was so powerful to, to think about the two of them together. Baldwin's thing above everything else, right, is trying to get us to see the world through the eyes of others. Not, you know, not just because it'll help us understand other people, but mo more importantly, Baldwin says, it'll help us understand ourselves, right? And so that, that sort of capacity for imagination is absolutely crucial, I think, for Baldwin's understanding of, of how we become better than we are. Um, and so Buckley, on the other hand, you know, he's writing a newspaper column three times a week, publishing a newspaper column three times a week. He's editing the magazine. He's on the road speaking to college audiences and other audiences 40 weeks of the year. Um, so he's engaged in this rapid fire politics and he's really performing conservatism. And so there's a kind of um, way in which that he's always thinking about himself as, you know, he's more concerned with shooting down, so to speak, rhetorically speaking, anyone who he sees as challenging his ideas, then he is really thinking deeply about his own views. And so there's something about that. So Buckley is, you know, there's no one quite like Buckley, you know, today in, in, in a lot of ways. But I, I think thinking in slow motion about what he was up to in those years, there's something about that that I think all of us can learn, uh, you know, about the nature of po political thinking or, or, you know, how to think well morally and politically. I think each of these guys are so different. They give us a lot of different ways to, to think about that. So what was the significance of this being a um, You kind of cut out there, Bridget. Uh, you froze so, up. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, let me. What was the significance of this being a transatlantic debate? Two American authors discussing American racism in the UK. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, that that was it was very significant. I mean, it's a it's a strange thing that this happens at the Cambridge Union, right? Uh, this this hundred and fifty year old debating society um, in England, and, and the sort of story of why it happened there, and so on, is is you know, is, is kind of part of that story. But it's also, I think it does help us, you know, think about the sort of transnational nature 
of the things that the discussion that was happening, right? So, and I'll just give a couple, you know, a couple, there's you know, sort of a Baldwin side and a Buckley side to that question, because I think it's a really important one. For Baldwin, there's a kind of, there's always this international dimension for Baldwin. Baldwin calls himself a transatlantic commuter. Um, he's, he's this cosmopolitan figure who's just sort of always on the move, um, spends time in Turkey, spends time in Paris, spends time all over the place. And in Baldwin, I think in terms of thinking about black liberation, that was really for Baldwin that we had to think about black liberation in transnational terms. So, you know, when he's there, both white supremacy and, and black liberation, I should say. So he's there at Cambridge. One of the things he says in his speech, he says, it's a little awkward for me to say this here, but the doctrine of white supremacy came to the US from Europe, you know, so it came from all, all you. Um, and well, the other thing that Baldwin, you know, and so he wants us to think about that, right? Buckley keeps saying, I am here as the defender of Western civilization. I am here defending the faith of our fathers, our fathers in this predominantly white space with these elite white university students. They're our fathers, that this is our faith. So there's that. But then there's also, Baldwin says, a kind of international dimension to black liberation. He says that one of the crucial things that we need to recognize in terms of why things are happening the way they are in the US in the 1960s, for Baldwin, a crucial part of that story is decolonization, right? It is decolonization that the idea, Baldwin says, of breaking down a lot of caricatures of black people. And you have, uh, Baldwin says, black heroes arriving on the scene. And you have, um, you have a, a sort, of, a sort of examples, historical examples that, you know, as, as black parents are teaching their children that they need to stand up and they need to fight back, uh, Baldwin says that in earlier generations, there was that message was being sent, but it was often being sent uh, in a way that wasn't entirely believable. But Baldwin says in the 60s, that's changing, the 50s and 60s, that's changing. So I think them being there on that international stage uh, was significant. Buckley says that what, you know, one of the things he concludes about that night at Cambridge is that it was an orgy of anti-Americanism. That's a phrase Buckley uses, um, that these were our, you know, the British, these young British students want to pick on their big cousins from across the pond. Um, and so Buckley kind of thought of the international dimension of this in that way, is that Baldwin is there just prior to the debate, he writes an editorial called Hate America and labels Baldwin the number one America hater, right? So Baldwin is there as somebody and from Buckley's view who hates America and he has all these young college students there to cheer him on in his hatred of America. So that's part of the story as well. And that's, there's a lot more to say that, but I'll, I'll leave it there. Uh, so there's another question, and I noticed that in reading and listening to the book that, you know, Buckley is constantly referencing Baldwin. Whenever he needs to, you know, bring up the issue of civil rights, it's like James Baldwin is who he goes to. That's his constant kind of reference. So one of the questions is, did Baldwin ever write about his debates with Buckley? If so, what did he say? Yes, yeah. So, yeah, as Bridget says, um, you know, Buckley, you know, Buckley was obsessed with several figures, um, Gore Vidal being another one, but Baldwin was on Buckley's mind a lot in the lead up to the debate and in the aftermath. Um, you know, when Buckley runs for mayor of New York, he, he's there to deliver his announcement of his candidacy and Baldwin is part of his speech at the announcement of his candidacy. Baldwin is part of his stump speech as a kind of, um, you know, as a, a sort of figure that is, is a representative of everything that's wrong. But on the, on the other side, right, Baldwin on, on Buckley, um, Baldwin doesn't tell us quite as much uh, about Buckley, but he does say a few things. And there's, there's a couple things I would really recommend to, to folks um, to check out. One, I, I argue in the book, so in 1965, a little bit after the debate, they have that second meeting on uh, the David Susskind show, who in those days was kind of the, the king of television. And they have this two hour debate on the Susskind show. It's the show that was called Open End. They called it Open End because it was the last thing on at night so they could just keep talking and talking until they passed out. They had this two hour debate and by everyone's account, it was, it was Buckley's night. So I should, I didn't say at Cambridge, spoiler alert, um, Baldwin wins. Baldwin's side wins 544 to 164. They actually have a, debate, a vote at the end of the debate. Uh, the open end appearance by almost everyone's um, recollection of it, including Baldwin's, Buckley has the better night. And one of the reasons Buckley has the better night is um, he gets under Baldwin's skin, which is something that Baldwin's agents and handlers were really worried about. Buckley was, you know, as, as Baldwin's agent says, Buckley is a master at getting under people's skin. And so in order to deal with him, you have to be cool. And Jimmy is never cool about the world's problems is what his agent said. And Baldwin and Buckley did get under Baldwin's skin on open end. So in this format where they're sitting there, the idea of open end is you basically sit there with a coffee table and cigarettes and coffee and maybe some whiskey 
and whatever and just talk and talk and talk. And so in that context, Buckley did his thing, which is he was so good at, at, in that kind of rapid fire debate um, format. He, he said something that really set Baldwin off, which was um, Baldwin was talking about, you know, what it felt like to live in Harlem and to know that the people in Harlem don't own Harlem and what that feels like. And, and the people in Harlem are, are you, know, you know, so but that was really an important point for Baldwin. And Buckley says, well, do the landlords tippy toe uptown and throw garbage in the streets? So when Baldwin heard that, he, he, says, I, he says, I was trying to do what Martin was doing. I was trying to listen. I was trying to, I was trying to get somebody else to listen to me. He says, in that moment, what I heard Buckley saying is the people who are living at the margins deserve to be there. And the people who are living in privilege deserve to be where they are. And for Baldwin, that was about as low as you can go. Um, Baldwin says, you know, he says that in that moment, I tuned out. He says, to my eternal dishonor, I tuned out. And I just basically lost the debate. I said, I can't even talk to this guy. So Baldwin just doesn't engage after that. And Baldwin says, what I should have done is hit him over the head with my coffee cup. Now, that was a joke that Baldwin made, but it had a serious point at its core which is that at the Cambridge debate, Buckley, or sorry, Baldwin says toward the end of his speech, what concerns me most is that our ability to hear each other, our ability to really try to understand each other will so break down that the very authority of discourse will, 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 will end, right? And that we'll be unable to even understand, even approach understanding one another's sense of reality. And Baldwin said that in 1965, and you, know, you think about where we are now, um, and Baldwin's idea there is extraordinarily haunting. So that's something that is, is sort of one of the, the, the sort of conclusions Baldwin reaches about Buckley is he's not a serious man. He's not someone who's willing to listen, who's willing to take someone else's ideas very seriously. So Nick, going back to Cambridge, um, how did Buckley feel about his loss in Cambridge? Yeah, so um, Buckley, uh, how did he feel about his loss? So it, it's it's really a fascinating thing. I mean, he 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 did on the other hand write a lot about the 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 loss at Cambridge, um, and he from you know his a couple of weeks later he publishes a syndicated column about it and sort of tries to explain away what happened there. Never for Buckley was it possible that he lost at Cambridge because Baldwin made better arguments. That was never something he entertained. He even two and a half weeks later already misremembers what happened at Cambridge. One of the things he says that he always used as a line, and it was a great laugh line after the debate, as he says that Baldwin received a standing ovation before he uttered a single word. Now that didn't happen. Now, and I, I don't know, Buckley always said it happened, but it didn't happen. There's, there's footage, we know it didn't happen, but it's, 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 it's a symbol in Buckley's mind of how rigged the game was that night, that it was so unfair that he was gonna be in this space with Baldwin where it was gonna be this kind of orgy of anti-Americanism as Buckley called it. But how did Buckley feel about it? Well, he says uh, to Gary Wills in 1968, he's being profiled for Esquire. Buckley says, of all the debates I've ever had, the debate I had with Baldwin at Cambridge, uh, with Baldwin at Cambridge is the one I'm most proud of. So Wills says, why? Um, and he says, I lost by the largest margin in all my debating career. And this is a guy who'd had a lot of debates, uh, but I didn't give them one goddamn inch. So Buckley, says that, that that phrase, right, don't give them one goddamn inch, I say in the book, could be Buck, Buckley's political slogan in general, right? He was so proud of his intransigence that night. Um, and he was so proud of the fact that he didn't give in to Baldwin in that setting. And there's, there's something about that, right, that is, I think, really, really significant. So for the rest of his life, you know, you know through, you know, the next, you know, so Baldwin dies in 1987, Buckley dies in 2008. Um, there's just, you know, every few years, Buckley's got to relive that Baldwin moment. He'll mention it in one book or another and just remind people that it, he did not lose because of Baldwin had better arguments or because Baldwin was right. Um, he lost really what, what we would say now, Buckley's explanation was kind of identity politics, right? Uh, Buckley says that Baldwin, the, the crowd liked Baldwin, they wanted to affirm Baldwin's identity because he was African-American, he was homosexual, he was a religious skeptic and he hated America. That's kind of the, the four things Buckley would always mention. And so that was Buckley's explanation of that. And I think that's very telling that that's how he understood what happened that night at Cambridge. So we've reached eight o'clock. Are you okay if we go over a few minutes? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the longer I, 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 I love, I love, you know, to hearing these questions and chatting with everybody. And um, I have a four-year-old and a six-year-old at home. So uh, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're being, you know, I don't have to, you know, try to get them in their pajamas, which is always a struggle. So um, don't tell my wife I said that. <laughs> um, also, wasn't it your quoting of Buckley that got you bleeped on PBS? I did get bleeped on PBS. My mom is, you know, I, she was a little disappointed. Uh, it was my big moment and I got bleeped. Yes. And I, I got bleeped on PBS quoting Buckley. So it was that line about, um, you don't, you know, I didn't give them one goddamn inch. Uh, so that's, that's what I'm getting. That's what I'm being bleeped with. You watch <laughs> the PBS thing. Yes. So another question, has anyone ever challenged you about the book saying it was biased and how did you become interested in writing about the debate? Yes. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I, uh, so the, I guess I'll, well, let me, let me take them in, in reverse order because I, I actually might, um, I think that might make more sense. So um, I became interested in the debate um, really by accident. I mean, I, I was invited to write an essay about Baldwin many years ago, um, probably 2012, 2013. And I, at that point, didn't know Baldwin nearly as well as I should have. Um, and so it was, a, it was, I told the editor of this volume, I said, I don't really know that much about Baldwin. And she said, well, you, know, you have two years to, to hand in the essay. So you can spend a year reading Baldwin and a year writing it. And I said, okay, that sounds reasonable. And then once I started reading more Baldwin again, I was just, you know, completely hooked. Um, and I, Buckley was somebody on my radar. I was, I was raised in a conservative household. I was, Buckley wasn't somebody who, you know, we were gathering around the TV every you know, Sunday watching Firing Line, but he was somebody on my radar as a kind of significant figure in the conservative movement. And um, I was always intrigued by him. There's something, you know, alluring about Buckley. He, love him or hate him, love him or hate his politics, love or hate his politics, he, he sort of has fans. This is one of the things I found out once I started working on Buckley is I would talk to people about it and I'd, you know, I'd say, oh yeah, you know, I'm, you know, somebody, you know, a lot of people on the left say, you know, I, I really don't like his politics, but I just love watching him. There's something about Buckley that's really alluring and, and interesting. He's this one of a kind character. Um, and I and also was interested in this kind of category of public intellectuals, people who are doing kind of intellectual work. Um, you know, I'm a political theorist by background, so I, they're kind of interested in political ideas, but they're doing it in a way that's presented, you know, um, with a public facing. And so I was intrigued by doing something on public intellectuals. And, and the more I got to know this story, um, the more I was pulled in and just transfixed by it. And I should say my own political evolution, I don't know what to call myself now, but my own um, political evolution, I think that, you know, sort of, you know, from my, my days sort of as a, somebody who identified as kind of conservative and libertarian when I headed into college, um, I, I think that a lot of my unsettling of my political convictions that I was raised with um, occurred through, the through, through studying history and through studying the black freedom struggle in particular. Um, first the abolitionists and then the, the civil rights movement. And so the, the idea for me as an individual interested in political ideas with that background to sort of bring these two things together was, you know, I think um, was really appealing. Uh, and so on the question of, of, of bias in, in the book, um, what I, I, I guess I have been challenged, um, you know, before the pandemic, I was all over the place on the road, you know, talking about the book and, um, there, there was, you know, always some Buckley people in the crowd. They would have good Buckley, Buckley, uh, Buckleyite questions, and um, and also National Review, his magazine reviewed the book and didn't love it, um, and you know a few other conservatives have have reviewed it, and I, I would say that um, the, the major, I mean, the sort of point of I think is most interesting to think about is my um, my job, as I see it, and again, I'm a I'm a political theorist, so maybe this might differ a little bit from somebody who thinks of the, the craft of history in a particular way. My job is to tell the truth, right, is, is the way I see it. And so what I tried to do in the book is to, to be fair to Buckley, to let Buckley speak for himself, to try to lay out his ideas in excruciating detail, probably far more detail than anybody would ever want, um, and to offer my, my explanation of it, right? And I, I do not think that my job is to abstain is to sort of um, stand back from making judgments, right? So by the end of the book, I make some judgments. Throughout the book, I make some judgments um, because I think that that's, and then that to me is not, um, it didn't, uh, I, I think of that sort of objectivity um, as, as being, I want to be fair. I want to tell the truth about the material as I see it. Um, but I don't think that that means I have to free myself from, from judgment. So that's where the, the, the sort of national review um, response to my book 
uh, and a couple of the other conservative responses. They've often been really quite generous with the, you know, the sort of the amount of research I did and so on. But I think that's where they, you know, they'll sort of say, well, you know, clearly he's on Baldwin's side in this, in this debate. Um, and I'm not shy about that. I think Baldwin was right about these issues uh, compared to Buckley. So yeah, and I, but I, and I really enjoy, one thing that's been a d bit disappointing is I've, you know, I had this very strange experience. My first book was probably read by about 19 people. Um, and this book has actually been read by like, you know, it was written for a general audience and it's been really cool to have all sorts of responses to it and, and you know, media interviews and stuff. And one thing I really wanted was more engagement with people who are conservative. Um, now, I wanted, you know, I wanted to do interviews with a lot of conservative folks and I haven't gotten as much of that as I would have liked because I really want to have these conversations because I think they're important. Um, so that's what I'll, I'll say about that and I'll leave that there. I went on too long. To that point, um, what do you make of our inability to have this kind of substantive exchange even in the political arena and how do you think we lost that ability? Yeah, um, you know, I mean, one thing, one thing I will say is that um, there is a kind of response to the debate that, will, that is kind of out there, I think, as a, as a narrative about the debate that I don't think is entirely right and that um, narrative goes something like, you know, you know, we can't even imagine this kind of conversation happening today. And I sort of see the point that people are making there or, um, or that, oh, like, you know, that Buckley and Baldwin could, you know, they could have this exchange in a respectful way and, and so on. And, and there's a way in which Buckley and Baldwin really did not like each other. I mean, like they really didn't like each other. So I, I've had like a, somebody from, you know, a journalist contacted me once and, and wanted to do this story about the debate because he kind of went into it with the, with the perception that, oh, like Buckley and Baldwin, like, look, they were so different. They disagreed with each other, but they could talk. And I, you know, the more I told him about the, the, the sort of true story, is that they really they couldn't talk? I mean, that's part of the, one of the one of the, the sort of less one of the sort of takeaways of the book. Um, and so, I, I think there is a kind of like intellectual depth that we see in in the engagement that is that does seem to be lacking in our you know our political culture, um, at least in the sort of major sources that a lot of people think about when they think about our sort of popular media. Um, but I do think that you know one of the things that that I, I think Baldwin would say that is really important, and I think we're we're in a moment right now where this, this maybe we're undergoing a kind of transformation as a culture, but Baldwin, Baldwin often said that one of our biggest problems is not disagreement, but dishonesty, right? So it's not that we disagree with each other. That's actually the least of our concerns in some sense. Baldwin said it's that we're not really honest with each other about what we, what we believe. Baldwin said that I, you know, one of the things that he would say often is that I, he said, I prefer to talk to a, a racist than I would a white liberal in some instances. And the, and the point he was making is that, you know, the, the racist will be honest with me about what he thinks. And a, and a white liberal, and so white liberal was a term used by a lot of folks in the civil rights movement, kind of meant to capture a sort of moderate, you know, that sort of has the right attitudes, but those attitudes don't really go anywhere. And so Baldwin said, a lot of white liberals, they're not really honest with me. He said, I mean, one of the essays that I was uh, talking about with folks uh, yesterday, Baldwin says, you know, it drives me crazy when I walk into a room and all these white liberals are congratulating themselves that I'm there, right? There's this kind of like patronizing thing that goes on. So Baldwin calls on us to be honest with each other. That's what it means to love each other, right? Baldwin, for Baldwin, love is confrontation. Love is a battle. Love is a war. Love is growing up. And he says that really to love one another, like he, he has these great lines about what a love letter means to him. A love letter, if you had a love letter from James Baldwin, it might be a very uncomfortable letter to read. Um, and so, yeah, I think Baldwin wants us to be more honest. I think right now in this moment, and we'll see if we can carry this momentum anywhere. Right now, I think people are being, you know, because of everything happening, uh, they're being a little more honest with each other than they are in, in ordinary life. And so I think that, that's, that has some potential for, uh, for something good, I think. Well, I think that's the absolute perfect place to, to leave it. So thank you so much for spending the time and answering all our questions and just making your magnificent book come to life even more so. I also highly recommend the audiobook to people as well. So they're all available through the library. So thank you so much for your time. Imagine this is, if there were a room full of people, this would be where the applause came. <laughs> well, thank, thank you all very much for being here. Thank you, Bridget and Heather for, you know, making this happen. Um, 
And yeah, definitely if you didn't get your question in and you want to contact me, uh, feel free to shoot me an email. I'm pretty easy to find. Um, yeah, and definitely the audiobook is is well worth checking out. Not read by me. It's read by an uh, incredible uh, narrator, Princess Sona Yemi. And it has at the end of it, I should say to people, has the full recording, audio recording of the debate itself. So the BBC recording you should all watch online um, is, is abridged to fit within an hour. And the, the audio book has the full, uh, the full recording um, at, the, at the end of it. So thank you all so much uh, for, for being here. I really appreciate the opportunity to chat with you.